You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 164. The scares are the easier part of scary movies. The hard part of scary movies is what leads up to the scares. Jason Blum. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle Pro, our private and growing community for filmmakers and screenwriters. It was created for film creatives like you to meet, network, and support each other, learn from film industry experts, and to get the answers to your burning questions and more. The journey in this business is rough. There is no guarantee to success, but your chances of reaching your goals dramatically improve when you find others who are on the same journey as you and you work together towards a common goal. That is why I put together IFH Pro. Inside, you'll get professional networking, private and safe spaces to discuss the film business, access to advanced tools and education, up-to-date education, exclusive content not available publicly, access to IFH Pro workshops, webinars, special guests, and so, so much more. If you want to check it out, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash pro. Guys, today we have a special, special episode. Today we have on the show... Oscar nominated producer and founder of the uber successful Blumhouse Productions, Jason Blum. Now, if you guys don't know who Jason Blum is, you've pretty much been sitting underneath a rock for, for a bunch of years now. Jason is best known for working on over 200 projects and numerous horror television and film franchises. He's produced Oscar-nominated films like Black Klansman, Get Out, and Whiplash. Now, Jason got on Hollywood's radar while working at Paramount, where he decided to put out a little movie called Paranormal Activity, which did fairly well, uh, to say the least. The films that he has produced have grossed over $4.8 billion dollars. And what is great about what he does is he does it all on a budget. Think Roger Corman with studio backing, where he really focuses on quality uh, and doing everything between three to five million for first first movies out in a franchise and then maybe go a little bit higher, but never breaking $10 million for a budget. And I think it's worked out for him so far. So we go into what a successful horror movie is, what a successful low-budget movie is, what are the pillars of the Blumhouse uh, system that he's created over the course of these years. And I have to tell you, this was a fun, fun, fun conversation. Jason is a force of nature. There are some surprises inside of the conversation that I think you guys are going to really like. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jason Blum. I'd like to welcome the show Jason Blum. How are you doing, Jason? Very good. How are you? I'm doing very good. Thank you so much for, for coming good. on the show, man. I'm excited to talk to a fellow low-budget independent filmmaker, but you do it at a completely different level than I do, or me- almost anybody does in Hollywood at this point. Uh, but I like the mentality behind how you make your films. 
Well, you too. We we love low budgets, right? Yes. I mean, and, and I think you've said it so many times on other interviews is like the freedom you get on a low budget is is immense. It's like rather than having $100 million, well, I'll make 20 movies for $100 million. <laughs> yeah, I love low budgets because you can take chances. You know, you can make movies that don't feel like other movies. You can work, you can bet on actors, you know, who maybe don't have the biggest, you don't have to use all famous people and mm -hmm. you can kill the lead after 30 minutes. And, <laughs> you know, you can make movies about gun control and racism and yes. all this stuff that makes everyone nervous. And I love, I love, I love low budgets. So uh, how did you get started in the business? Uh, let's see. I got started. Um, I, I, uh, I, uh, I, I went to college with Noah Baumbach, mm -hmm. um, who's a great filmmaker, yeah. writer, director. And he, his first movie he wrote was a movie called kicking and screaming, which was, uh, about five kids, uh, in college. Mm -hmm. I was one, I was one of those kids was based on me. And, um, <laughs> he wrote the script and I, my friend, uh, Jeremy and I said, let's produce this together. We had no idea what that meant, and we sent it to every rich person we knew. They all turned us down. <laughs> one guy uh, who was actually one of my ex-girlfriend's dad uh, had was an investor in a movie company in New York called Arrow. And Arrow almost made Kicking and Screaming, and at the end of the summer, they said, I, I'm not going to make the movie, but I'll give you a job. And Dennis Friedland uh, gave me my start in the movie business, and I worked for this little company called Arrow Entertainment for three years, and that's, uh, that's how I started. And, and then, you know, we'll, we'll jump a little bit. Fast forward to Paranormal Activity. How did you get involved with a film like that? And I mean, the, the phenomenon that that became. Um, so, yeah. So Paranormal Activity came much later, maybe <laughs> uh, 10 years later. I was I was in my mid 30s. Um, I relatively recently moved to Los Angeles to try and, uh, you know, make my way in Hollywood, which is. <laughs> complicated and uh and we had a we had a first look deal i had i had an overall deal at paramount we had a first look deal with a with a guy named steven schneider who's a who's who's a, who's a producer but he's more 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 well known for um a hundred movies you should see before you die or a thousand movies you should see before you die that series of books he edits that series of books mm -hmm. so he he took that cachet he had from those books and started his uh producing career and it, it was it was pretty good and he's really kind of an expert in uh in uh in horror movies and um and he is the one i think who initially brought my attention to uh to the the paranormal activity movie which was actually sent to us as a directing sample we were told uh we were told by the agent that the movie was going to go directly to dvd but that we did we want to work with the director and steven and i both saw the movie and we said or or Steven showed me the movie and I said, you know, I bet this could work in a movie theater and the rest is history. But it was it was a long journey from that moment to when it came out in the theater it was actually three years. When you were starting out and, and had that first job uh, in in the an arrow, what was the what was the lesson that you wish you would have told your younger self? Uh, that you had to learn the hard way during those those years, those early oh, years. My lesson, my lesson I would have told myself, well, I don't know if it's a lesson, but the advice I would have given myself is to try and be a little less stressed out. I was very nervous. <laughs> you know, maybe maybe that's what made me successful. I was so anxious about everything. But uh, but uh, but I would have told my I would have told my former self to relax a little bit. But you seemed a little bit more relaxed now. I mean, you've chilled a bit over. I mean, I age know. age chills you in general. I mean, as you get older. <laughs> I'm more relaxed now, definitely by far. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I we, used some of this when I was 22. Oh God, can you imagine? As I always say, and I'm not the only one that's ever said this: the youth is definitely wasted on the young. It is wasted. <laughs> Be so great to be young now. Uh, with with our minds today, Jesus, the damage right. we could, the damage we could do, Jesus, oh, unbelievable. <laughs> now, when you opened up Blumhouse, um, was it kind of like a uh, uh, you opened that up because of the frustrations you had with the general Hollywood machine of like making big budget movies and ego and always have to like if you make a small movie then and that's a hit you've got to make another bigger movie and things like that is that one of the reasons why you started Blumhouse yeah you know my dad had his own company and I, I grew up in a in a in an environment where having your own company seemed possible Mm -hmm. And I worked for other people and I thought, God, I definitely want my own company. I think I think initially it was not my frustration in Hollywood, but my fr I, I hated working for other people. I just <laughs> I, 
I, I did not like it at all. It just didn't, didn't, it did not work for me. I wanted to do things my way. I didn't want to do things the way someone else wanted me to do them. And, uh, and that, that's what gave me the drive to start my, I mean, my own company it was me and my apartment. That was my own company. It was me and my apartment with a telephone and an assistant who would come, you know, he'd come over to that apartment from nine to five or whatever. And the two of us just sat there and, you know, tried to sell movie scripts and we sold them, you know, we made them, we got these little movies made. They were, they were pretty crappy movies, but we got them made. And that mm-hmm. was, that was, uh, that was, that was what drove me to start. And then Blumhouse, what, you know, when we was really paranormal activity was this idea of an independent movie distributed by a studio. And that, that seemed like the kind of company I wanted to, that's what I wanted to pursue as a, uh, as a model for filmmaking. And then tell me how the relationship with Universal came because you have arguably one of the most incredible deals in Hollywood. Uh, I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't exist anywhere else. When I heard the deal, I was like, how the hell did he get that? And then the success on success on success. I mean, you're only as good as, the, as many successes as you have, but how did that relationship even start? How did you even get, how did you convince a major studio to your craziness? <laughs> Uh, I made I I I I I I made the such a successful movie for Paramount, and then a second movie for Paramount that they kicked me off the lot, and uh, <laughs> and because they wanted to keep all the credit for themselves. Wow! Uh, and the money too, although Shocking. they had more trouble doing that. And uh, <laughs> um, my uh, my dear friend and partner in crime, uh, Brian Lord at CAA, had a lunch with uh, Donna Langley, who runs ran Universal and still mm-hmm. does. And Donna said to Brian, you know, we really want to bring back the monsters and the tradition of scary movies at Hollywood. And Brian said, you should meet Jason Blum. And uh, the first deal I had with Universal was a very small deal. And, uh, and, um, oh God. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, we, I made a deal there. No, no one else, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, it wasn't like, uh, it was a bidding war. I mean, I didn't have any other opportunities. <laughs> Deal and I took it, I should say, <laughs> and it turned out turned out great. But it was a, it was a, it was a real leap of faith on her part, and you know I'll always be indebted to her for that. So what what was the first movie with that original Bird. deal? Purge. It was, was it was James is as as uh, as our friend James DeMonico. Yeah, James DeMonico's movie. We did the purge. We screened it in this little this theater in the valley and a test screening and all of universal showed up. Cause it was like the new horror guy, you know, Nikki, Nikki Rocco was there and like yeah. all the brass from universal. They're all going to this two and a half million dollar movie. And, uh, they all liked it. And they, the company released it. Adam, Adam Fogelson was there and, uh, it was great, but, uh, but, uh, but it was very nerve wracking. So when you work with when you worked with James because James was I, I don't know how what he had done prior to the purge I think he just even, but this was a big deal for him um, and when you work with James uh, on that whole project when two and a half million dollars thinking about it now is like when you watch the purge you're like really that's all it cost it's two point seven it yeah, looks it so it looks so amazing yeah. um, how since this was like the first big thing for you how did you talk to James about did James have final cut. Did, like, how did that work? Did you like, did, did you no. have that power yet? You know who had final cut on the movie? Um, uh, Michael Bay. Bizarrely. <laughs> That's Michael, right. He's... Michael, Bay, Michael Bay's a genius. So Michael Bay yes. has these two, uh, two guys, uh, Drew and Brad, who, 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 was, who were working for him. And I met with them and we were like, let's do a movie together. Da, 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 da. And, and. They, he gave us a movie to do or something. And I said, great, let's do it. And Michael said, you know, ah, I'm not going to give you a movie of ours to produce unless you give something of us to me to produce. So, of course, we never made the movie he gave us. But meanwhile, we've made six purges and a, and a purge TV show, all of which Michael Bay produced. Um, uh, uh, but anyway... Michael Bay had final cut on, uh, on uh, he, he, he still does, by the way, he really? has final cut on every purge movie. He had final cut. Oh, old, old, old Michael Bay. 
That's, I mean, and, I, and I've said that a thousand times, and like whether you love him or hate him, he changed action movies. He's an absolute genius, visually. Yeah, you know, I was just, I just had lunch with, uh, with, 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 uh, with Jake Gyllenhaal, who starred mm -hmm. in his movie. And, uh, you know, I always get the best advice from, you always get the best take on directors from actors, always. Actors know better than anyone else. And, uh, and Jake was just saying, you know, he's one of the best directors, if not the best, one of the best directors that he's ever worked with. Like, it's just, he, he's just, he's, he's, you know, really great at this, at this, at this, at this specific thing, but also at movie making, you know, Jake, Jake just loved them. I mean, I never, I mean, I made the guy, you know, the guy's very rich. I made him a lot of money. I never heard from the guy. I mean, it's unbelievable. <laughs> you know, can't even get him on the phone for God's sakes. Well, no, I haven't tried to call him. He should be calling me. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> now, what are you, you kind of laid out this model for, for Blumhouse films. What are the few of the rules that you, um, that you look for or have to abide by for a Blumhouse release? Uh, on the movie side for the original, for an original movie, you know, we have to have, you know, I always say you, you can either have a lot of locations, a lot of speaking parts or a couple of special effects, but you can't have you can't have you can't have more than one of those categories. Mm -hmm. So really, it's a funny way of saying with the movies that the scope of these movies has to be has to be has to be small, you know, not too many locations, not too many characters, no stunts, no special effects or very limited stunt, limited special effects. And you have to be willing to work for scale um, and a participation if the movie makes money. And if it doesn't make money, then you're not going to make anything more than scale. And. And why do you th – were you afraid of people uh, or, the, or, or, the, or the town starting to copy this model when, this, when you first came out and you had success after success? And you're like, oh my god, I'm going to have 40 competitors. Uh, all the major studios are going to obviously be doing this. It hasn't turned out that way, but were you afraid of that happening? Uh, you know, I'm very competitive, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not I, – I don't I – don't, I, I don't, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't have a lot of fear. I'm not like fearful mm -hmm. in that way. So no, I mean, I was annoyed if people would try and do it, but I, <laughs> I wasn't afraid of that. I was, I was, I, but I'm always competitive when someone else has a successful horror movie. I'm all horribly competitive about that. <laughs> Fair enough. And I then mean, a quiet place almost sent me to my grave. <laughs> But you had Get Out, so I think, and Split. I mean, you did okay. I wanted all the horror. I wanted The Conjuring <laughs> and Quiet Place. I don't have enough. <laughs> when, when Jordan showed up with Get Out, how did that get, I mean, did you, how did that whole process end? Because did anyone think this was going to be a hit? No one wanted to make that script. You know, the script was lying around for a long time. And, uh, and uh, we read it. I thought the script was great. I had a great meeting with Jordan. We talked about race in the meeting because I wanted to be comfortable. I, if we're going to make a movie about race, I want to be able to talk. I remember saying to Jordan, like, is it true? Like if there's a party and it's all white people and there's like one other black person, you guys like acknowledge that? And he's like, yeah, it's definitely true. And I thought, I thought I'm never in a party where it's all black people and another white person. It wouldn't occur to me that right. you kind of nod at each other like here we are. But of course it makes sense. Um, and uh, and I, I found it you know, very easy to talk to Jordan about race and, and, and he had such a clear vision for what he wanted to do with the movie. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, we, I loved it. You know, we loved it. And we, uh, we, uh, we had our partners in Burbank make it and the rest is history. <laughs> now when, um, yeah, it, it, it definitely did. Okay. It did. All right. Uh, it did okay. It did okay. And, and I and I saw in one of your other interviews you did that you got uh, – you were like, oh, Jordan won the Oscar. But I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great. It's so honest. It. You know, I got nominated. I got the booby prize. <laughs> now, when you yeah. work – He deserved it. No, and, and without question. Um, now, when you work with directors, it seems that, you know, looking at your filmography – They made a mistake that year though. They did make a mistake. I mean that's – that we know – everyone has acknowledged that. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. academy has acknowledged that they may have a separate Oscar ceremony to acknowledge their mistake. <laughs> and give the best picture Academy Award to the picture that should have won that. that. Obvi obviously, the, uh, I think they'll be coming to your door any second, any That's second, any second. <laughs> now the um, 
now when you it seems like that from looking at your filmography the directors you you work with a lot of times they're not first time directors i don't think there's ever a first time director we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor and now back to the show but a lot of them the blumhouse there are for our streaming movies and stuff like that there are but our on our other model they rarely are Jordan technically was a first time director. Yeah. Joel Joel Edgerton technically first time director, but they both of them had a lot of set experience. Right. It wasn't like their first time on set and they they knew how to yeah, they didn't know what they knew what a grip was. Uh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. which is more than I didn't know. <laughs> so when you're working a lot of a lot but a lot of the filmmakers you work with, uh some of them were in filmmaker jail. Uh and then they come to you to get out of filmmaker jail. Uh you know, like M Night and uh, I mean, M Night's a great example because, I mean, and I love what M Night did because after a few of his films, he was just kind of like, "Oh, it's over." Don't, which is always insane to me. Like, how can you take the keys away from an M Night Shyamalan? Like, how, how is that? Like, how does the town work that way? But when Split came out, I'm like, "Ah, oh, he's he's back, he's back, baby." You know, you know, and and you give those opportunities back to these amazing filmmakers. I did. I brought him back, and then he kicked me to the curb. It's outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like I mean it seems essentially you are money you are money ball for movies and I know that's the term that's been thrown around before. I was, that yeah, I mean we I mean you know we're we're less that now in all serious we 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 we're less of that now and that that's because um when we started the company there was there was a there was there were a lot of super talented people who are not working and that's no longer the case mm-hmm. it's that there's so much work now in, in tv and streaming and movies there's just so much work now that it's it's you can't replicate what we used to do that really isn't that the idea of like moneyball for movies you know it's it's not really you, you can't really do it anymore because everyone's working so much but definitely the first you know five six seven years of the company that's what I used to always say to people. No one, no, it's funny to hear you say that because no one, no one, no one knew what the hell I was talking about when I said that. But that's exactly what we did. You know, we looked instead. Hollywood looks at your last movie. They don't look at your body of work, which is insane. It's, it's insanity. You know, we always looked at the body of work like, huh, the guy that did Saw, you know, he did two movies that didn't work after that. But he wrote and directed the, like the most success, one of the most successful horror franchises ever of all time. I bet that guy can, if he gets this in a horror movie, I bet it'll be good. You know, that was James Wan, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. And, and, but you give those opportunities and, and again, Hollywood is just a, such a, it's such a weird town and it's, it's in its DNA, this whole concept of having to spend more. It's almost ego. Like, you know, it, you, like I think you said before the cool kids, the cool kids spend a lot of money and you're not a cool kid. <laughs> I'm not a cool kid. No, the cool kids, they spend a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But but you make a lot with your money, so then you become a cool kid after the fact. <laughs> you think? I'm not so sure. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to sit at the cool kids table. No, but I was. I remember listening to uh, Robert Rodriguez when he did. I mean, who's one of the originating low budget guys right. uh, in in the '90s from coming from the '90s, and he did uh, Spy Kids, and it was a huge hit. But he did it for like 30 million, which was a big VFX thing. But then yeah. afterwards, after he's like, okay, here's 100 million. Like, no, no. Just give me 30 again. I'm good. <laughs> that was smart. That was smart. Because the That's second one didn't do as much. <laughs> people make big mistakes. They Every every manager and every agent, they their their idea of you have a successful movie is to make your client making a more expensive movie, which is which is stupid. Do you do you find that there's where do you find the resistance to your model? Is it more in the representative side, in the talent side? Like where because when you go, you know, the representation, although now it's better because I've made a lot of people a lot of money, but (laughs) representation, it's not even their fault. It's just they're compensated by it's like quarterly bonuses. Right. So they're (laughs) very, very incentivized to make money fast now. If you said, I'll pay you $50 an hour, $100 over three years, uh, give me the 50 now and then I'll get a job for another client. So it's not it's not that they're it's not that they're. Um, short-sighted. It's just the, 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 the incentives aren't aligned mm-hmm. and the representative is incentive with the client is not really aligned. Like the client is much better with a hundred dollars over three years. The agent is kind of better with 50 bucks right now and then go to the other ones to get more. 
Um, so that's just the way the system is set up. I don't, I don't, you know, it's, it's hard to really blame people for that no, as much as I'd like to. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, when you work with directors, uh, I heard somewhere that you give directors cuts, uh, to a lot of filmmakers that you work with. Give is that, final yeah, final cut. Yeah. Final yeah, cut. We, get final, we always give final cut to our filmmakers. Yeah, we do. That, I, I, not always, but 99%, 95% of the time we do. Other than Michael Bay. Well, no, he was the filmmaker yeah. in that. Right. So we actually did give the filmmaker. We didn't keep it ourselves. We gave it to him. Right. Exactly. Of course. Of course. Yeah. But but that is so against the grain in Hollywood. Like to get final cut, it's almost a well, myth at this I point. It's, I think it's immoral to ask someone to work for a reduced rate, but then tell them, "But I'm going to tell you what to do." <laughs> like if you ask someone to bet on yourself, you have to allow them to bet on your, themselves. So if they go down sinking. They can't say, well, this is your fault. I mean, if you're really saying like you're financially invested in the movie, you can't do those two things. They, 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 they don't work together. You mm -hmm. either, either you pay people a lot of money and then, you know, you could, I would have no problem t taking final cut. If people are making money up front, then we do take final cut. But if you're not making money up front, if, if then, if, and you're the director who has the most control over a movie by far. Mm -hmm. I, I think I just like I said, I think it's immoral to 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 take final cut from them. Yeah, because I remember, I mean, when Spielberg and those guys started getting final cut, but then they were they were handing out final cut like candy back in the day uh, in the 80s, in the, days. in the old days. But then it's, it's just unheard of to have that kind of control. But I guess, again, because you're at that, such a low budget, you can you can play. You can do yeah. things that you just don't do. In a, it's hard to give a hundred million dollar final cut. It's just very difficult. Yeah, that's what I mean. Expensive movies, I never do it. Final Cut has only, um, of the 150 movies that we've made, there have only been like less than five times where Final Cut really um, hurt us and hurt the movie, which is a pretty good ratio. That's not a bad ratio at all, actually. Yeah. 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 Now, what – some of your films go directly to streaming other or, or or VOD and others go theatrical, then go there. What is your determining factor on which goes where? Well, sometimes it's predetermined, like Welcome to the Blumhouse, all these movies for Amazon, they're all going to go directly to streaming. built, yeah. Um, when we make an original movie for Amazon, we, we I, I screen the movie in front of an audience and 99% and of the time, it's very clear. If you show the movie in front of an audience, the movie is connecting with a big group of people in a movie theater in such a way that it should play in a theater or it's or the tone may be kind of the tone may be kind of different and it kind of may be slower or it may be, you know, the audience, you don't you, you, you feel it where the audience is not like the movie could work at home, but it's not going to work in a movie theater. And then we do. <clears throat> we don't really do limited releases. We either do, funnily enough, we either do like a really wide release or mm -hmm. we go, you know, we'll do it straight to ancillaries, to VOD or to iTunes or to all the all the different places you can order movies online now. Now, uh, you have uh, the, the dubious uh, honor of having a couple of records uh, of, of note. Uh, some are dubious, some are, are not dubious. Uh what are my bad? What are my bad records? I need to hear immediately. Is it the widest released film? No, we got, we got, we we gave that record up. I want oh, you to know. I you gave it up. Oh, no, we no longer hold that record. <laughs> oh and my god! Ask my partner here. Do you know what the movie that took that? Oh, ask Cooper. He knows. Okay. There's a movie that took that record from us. I was sorry to see it go. <laughs> I had to pass the torch. That's what I'm sure you were ter you were you were really torn up about it. <laughs> I was real torn up about it. <laughs> now, um I have this is one question I've always wanted to ask you. What makes a good horror movie? The name uh Blumhouse showing before the film. <laughs> I'm very, this interview is gonna be a great interview. I'm feeling very, very I don't know what it is. I'm I'm, I'm hunch drunk, but I am not drunk and I haven't even done that many interviews. Now, Cooper, what is the movie that took the our record for widest ride release, lowest gross? Uh gosh, I think it was Warren Beatty, I wanna say. No, you knew oh. this. We yeah, we yeah. celebrated giving up this record. You don't remember? No, I know. I know. You're on the air. You're live on the air right now. So you, <laughs> pressure's on. Oh my god. Yeah, live on the air in a in a live interview. 
That's your interviewer. Hi, Cooper. <laughs> no, no pressure. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, hold on, hold on. Can you hear me? Yeah, just oh, FaceTiming you. No, FaceTiming. Oh, you're FaceTiming me. Okay. Was it Rock the Casbah? Was it Rock the Casbah? No, that was the same weekend. I came out the same weekend. Oh, no, 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 not Rock the Casbah. <laughs> Uh, are, are you literally doing a junket right now? It's a junket, and you're alive. <laughs> you're coming up without answers, Cooper. Um, it may have been Rules Don't Apply, the, the Warren Beatty movie. Okay, <laughs> maybe Warren Beatty. We'll go for that now. If you if you find out something else, text Karen, and then we'll 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 okay. call it in. Bye. Okay. Now, now, now. This interview is going to be one for the ages. I mean, this interview is really got a, a week long. I mean, I oh love my it. God, I love now, it. What, I absolutely love you're it. Great, right. You're a great interviewer. You really relax. You're, you just, you talked about James DeMonico. You, yeah. You called me James. Yeah. You got my guard down. I mean, you just, you, 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 you're it's just all, all it's all calculated. I, I'm, I am a master at this, sir. <laughs> just like making a good horror movie. Only, only good horror movies have Blumhouse at the front. Oh, oh, oh right. Only good horror movie. Well, you first have to have Blumhouse. And that, if you have that, you're on a good road. Yes. A good horror movie should survive if you have take out the scares and just watch it with no scares it should be a great drama so a good horror movie has a great story and great acting if you have a great story and great acting the movie the scares will work if you have a, not a good story and not a good acting you could have the greatest scares in the world in your movie and they won't be scary you got to get the audience riveted with what's going on mm -hmm. plot wise and story wise and in order to do that you have to have a good story and you have to have great actors they have to believe what they're seeing. So when you surprise them with a the scare, they're so entrenched in the story that they're not ready for it. And then it's scary. And if you, if, 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 if you don't do that, you're not going to be scared. So, yeah, because it's, it's, um, horror movies are infamous for uh, being, you know, they're bad. A lot of, there's so many bad horror movies out there and then your films aren't. Uh, so there's a reason. Why, like, what's the difference? Case A, you have to have Blumhouse. There you go, Obvi right? Obviously, obviously. All right. The movie, by the way, that took that <laughs> was the Empty Man. What's the Empty Man? Exactly. <laughs> well, the Empty Man. You look it up, but the Empty Man took my award as the least successful, wide released, lowest grossing film of all time. Wow. Thank you for thank you for updating that because yeah please correct them because I was a fan of Gem in the Holograms personally that movie was great I it still, was, I still there love are it new movies <laughs> that we've done um, uh, Freaky is an mm -hmm. A plus movie should have been a hit and mm -hmm. it got all screwed up the release is all screwed up my fault by the way I, I take all the blame for the release I screwed it all up but boy it, what, there's nothing more frustrating as a filmmaker when you Listen, if you make a movie and it's not so great and it doesn't work, it is what it is. And we've done plenty of those. But when you make a movie that's really fucking awesome and it doesn't work, it's so frustrating. And, mm. you know, I always um, feel guilty about Chris Landon, who made this great movie and we didn't deliver for him. And we're good at delivering. I always say to our directors, if you give me the goods, I can make the movie a hit. But uh, and I usually can, but I wasn't able to with Freaky, which kills me. And what kills me even more is I wasn't able to do it with John Chu, who's turned out to be, you know, the greatest director he's, on the planet. He's done so OK. These are two. These are two. These are two tremendous disappointments that I try not to let keep me up at night, but often do. But <laughs> well, I think but you, you've done a few other ones that have been OK. So I think they balance out and a lot of successes. That's true. That's about to balance things out. Now, do you believe do you think that the purge? is almost like the perfect embodiment of the Blumhouse model as far as the rules are concerned of what the low budget pillars of Yeah, there are two, there are two movies that are that are that are really there. Oh, there are more than two, but like The Purge is perfect, high concept, low budget. I think Get Out is pretty no. near perfect. Right. Kind of high concept, low budget, you know. Um Sinister and Insidious also really are uh, uh, where are where where they really embody what a Blumhouse original is. They check all the boxes that it's this super gripping, um, wide release, wide appeal movie made for very little money. And the acting is great. The, 
the story is great, the characters are great, and as a result, the movies are scary as hell. And uh, like in Get Out, I mean, I think the the, mo- the biggest set piece was the the deer crash, right? That was like the most yeah, the biggest the visual crash. effect. It's the goofiest thing crash in the world, but it's so scary because you have Allison and Daniel like talking. It's this it's this it's this mixed race couple, and they're talking about race, and it's like you're you're just you're. It's exactly what I described. You're on the edge of your seat because they're like ta- he's like. Your parents don't like black people. And it's like, oh, my God, where is this going? Oh, my God, where is this going? And the deer hits and you jump out of your seat because you're so focused on the conversation between the two of them. And the, the, the I, th- I think I heard you say this once before, the uh, the difference uh, on being cheap and, and understanding how to get the most out of the budget is something as simple as if there's a waiter that comes to your to your table, he doesn't say or she doesn't say, um, oh, would you like to hear the specials? They come in, they drop the kids off, and the difference between a day rate of speaking day rate versus a walk on. Oh, yeah. We don't like we don't like characters to speak. And yeah, waiters <laughs> never speak in our movies. They always come up with a pad and they go like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> because of the because that's a substantial cost difference. If they speak, it costs me six hundred dollars. What are you crazy? <laughs> and if they don't speak, how much does it cost? It uh, six hundred dollars less. <laughs> That's how much it costs. <laughs> and, and it's so funny to hear someone of, of, you know, someone like yourself who's done, you know, so many movies talk like this because you don't hear producers in Hollywood talk like this. Like that's that's just not something that's talked about. It's like, oh, well, you know, I'll just write it in. Or, it, it, yeah, it's because they're not there. That's because they're already they've been paid up front. You see, the producer <laughs> is already made his money so what, or her money. So what do they care if the characters talk? We don't make any money unless these things make money. So we're. We're very conscious of where we spend because every 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 dime we spend is a dime less we make. That's why everyone should. I, I always think you know movies and shows would be so much better if everyone worked for much much less money up front and then made money uh, when the thing you're doing connects. Sadly, we're going further and further away from that model, <laughs> and closer and closer to that model because streamers will have nothing of. My my silly ideas. Exactly. Yeah. So the streamers aren't thinking about doing five. No, million. no, 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 no. The streamers, what they do is they pick, they pick, you know, 20, 30 projects a year that they think are going to be wild home runs. The Exorcist was one of them. They pay everyone as if the movies have already come out in our home runs mm-hmm. and the rest of everything they do, they pay less. And it's a very different way of, of of compensating people you i have to imagine that i mean obviously you've had a lot of success you've been you know you've been nominated for some oscars with whiplash and and get out uh and and other films but and exactly black Klansman. um but do but i have to just because i've been in town so long uh and and i was i was i've been in i was in la for 13 years and i've done all the water bottle tours and i've been in those meetings with agents and producers and things trying to get projects made Someone like you with your energy and the way you're looking at things, I can't believe that you were open arms <laughs> accepted with these concepts when you first started out. I have to believe everybody was just like, this guy's nuts. They still think I'm nuts. <laughs> I was about to say that. They still think you're absolutely uh, insane. Who are you talking to? Yeah. I'm like, I'm like Crazy Eddie. Remember him? Where are you of from? Of course. I'm from, I'm from New York, so I completely know what Crazy Eddie is. Crazy Eddie? You kind of, I'm not going to say it, but you kind of a little bit. I'm a little bit like Crazy Eddie. I've been told that before. I I was proud of that. These movies are insane. (laughs) These movies are insane. (laughs) That's your logo. You should so do. These are insane. I think it's fun to do. I think what are we doing in Hollywood if you're not trying to do sun, you know, crazy stuff? I mean, I think it's, I think it's, uh. We could, you could be you know, digging ditches is, somewhere. We could be digging ditches what? somewhere. We could be digging ditches somewhere. Yeah, we're supposed to be having, you know, we're supposed to be having fun and making challenge. I think also you have to, I think the artistic process is better if you're a little looser about what you're doing. I think if you have all this tension, it doesn't serve the director as well. So I try and, I don't know, believe me, I don't, I'm not always like this, but I try and, try and keep a, keep a, keep a, sense of humor about what we're doing. I mean, I can't even comprehend what, you know, some of these directors with $200 million on their head or, or, I mean, God forbid, James Cameron. Yeah, that, even <laughs> that, like it's, it creates so much pressure unless, you know, 
some directors can work with that kind of money and not feel pressure, but most of the, most of the time they they do, and I, I think it doesn't doesn't help the creative on the movies. Um, now tell me about Welcome to Blumhouse. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, welcome, well, welcome to the Blumhouse. Welcome yes. to Blumhouse is. Uh, is uh, a, se- a series of eight movies we did with Amazon. Okay. And we made this deal with them about two or three years ago. And Jen Salky, who runs Amazon, who I knew a little bit from her time at NBC, um, right when she started, um, she kind of pitched this idea to me. And I, I lit up to the idea because we look at so many scary movie scripts and there are a lot of great ones that don't fit for a wide theatrical release but that I'd love to make, that I think would be fun bets to take. And when we did this deal with her, it gave me a place to put um, to put these movies. So we were actually able to say yes to people who we couldn't say yes to before. And um, we chose to do all underrepresented filmmakers, which is which is which is something we both really wanted to do, which is a more accurate reflection of what our audience looks like. You know, our audience audience for horror movies, the minority uh, is Caucasian looks like you and I, you know, most people who watch our movies don't. And it didn't make a lot of sense to me that, that the people behind the camera weren't reflecting that. Um, and so this is the second we did four last year, and this is our second four this year. And I think the difference between the four this year and last year is that, is that this year we, we not only have, um, people from underrepresented groups directing the movies, but we also, the movies are actually about marginalized groups of people mm-hmm. and I noticed that in, in a more pointed way than um, than the last four movies. So I felt like, you know, the stories that we're telling better represent the idea of hearing from directors we were, were not used to hearing from. Um, so uh, I love the movies. I'm really proud of the movies. I think they're really cool. They're very different. Mm-hmm. They're very, you know, speaking of all the things kind of we, we've just talked about, they're definitely really original. All four movies don't remind me of anything else I've 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 seen recently or a long time ago, and um, and I'm I'm excited for people to see them, and I was excited to be able to give um, all these directors a shot, and I think like the first four directors we work with, um, they're all going to go on to do more interesting things. Now I have to believe that you walking around uh, at a film festival or at an event or even just walking around LA you might get recognized and you might get pitched uh, by somebody like, hey, I got this idea. Hey, I got this screenplay Hey, because that's L.A. Um, does that happen often to you? And how should you properly pitch a, a, pro- a project to Blumhouse? Because they're like, oh, he's doing the kind of movie that I'm writing. He, it's be perfect for you, uh, Jason. So how, how do you properly do it? And do you, have you had any stories of people walking up to you like, hey, here's my script? <laughs> Well, you asked two very different questions. Okay. I'm going to break them down separately. Do I get recognized and how do I feel about it? The answer is not nearly enough. I love nothing more than being recognized. It's the greatest thing ever when people ask to take selfies, especially when I'm with my wife because it really pisses her off. So if you see me, please don't hesitate to come up to me, ask for my autograph or take a selfie or do anything. Well, not anything because that's the second part of the question. Yeah. But – but but I love it. It does, it, and it does happen sometimes. And yeah. uh, and I'm working on making it happen more in every way I possibly can because I find <laughs> it find it awesome. And I love to make my wife angry. Yes. That's the answer number one. Do not, if you see me though, please don't pitch me your movie. That would not be a good way to um, get your movie uh, read or heard about. Um, in fact, it's it's really uh, not a good way. First of all, you have to have representation. Um, which is just the rules of the game to submit a project to us. But if an agent or a lawyer submits something to us, someone at the company will always read it. And um, if it's something that feels right for us, more people will read it and eventually I'll read it. And, and, and that's, that's the way to get us to do something. And the other way in is if there's someone, you know, the other thing that always helps is if there are a lot of people, there are almost 100 people who work at the company, and if someone knows someone who works at the company and has read your particular script, fine for that person to call the person they know at Blumhouse and say, hey, 
you should look at this submission or whatever. I get, I get emails or calls like that all the time. Um, but that's, that's the way to submit to something, not on the street. But, but like I said, very happy to do a selfie. With you. <laughs> Sounds good. Now I'm going to ask you three questions. I ask all of my guests, what, oh. a le- what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Well, the, 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 the premise of that question, <laughs> um, you, you, the, you, you're implied in the question is like, I've learned all the lessons. No, no. I haven't learned all these lessons. What right? are you still learning? Yeah. No, that's a, uh, yeah. Still working on. Yeah. What are you still working on? Okay. What I'm still working on is, um, uh, patience. Mm-hmm. I'm still working on, um, not raising my voice, mm-hmm. uh, which I've done before, which I don't, which I'm not proud of. So I'm trying not to do that. Um, um, those are my two biggest things that I'm still working on. Now, what did you learn from your biggest failure? I think, I think every, I mean, it's cliche. Every failure makes, makes you stronger, but mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm, my biggest failure, there are like seven things going on in my head right now that I'm thinking about. <laughs> I think that, um, what, what, what you learn from your failure is that you can recover, that life goes on so that, so that, so that although you can fail at something or another thing, you don't fail at life or you don't, the company doesn't go down. And, and I think, I think the scary thing about failure is you think if you fail, you won't live again to fight another day. And I think what I, what I've learned from all my failures is I've gotten stronger and realized not to, t- not t- to move past them and move into your next, you know, your next chapter and not to dwell on your failures. I think that's what I've learned. Was there a moment on any of your 150 plus films that you were a producer on that you were on set that day and everything was going to absolute hell? And you fig- and how did how did you handle that day? And what did and what did you do to break from like to get through that that obstacle? Yeah, we on, when when the beginning of Sinister, the first shot we shot on the beginning of Sinister is when uh, the the four, the family is hanging from the tree. Mm-hmm. We had a we had a we had a terrible stunt person, and oh. we hung the four people from the tree. No one was, um, you know, no one was no one was 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 heard in a way they had to go to a hospital or anything, but the stunt went wrong and someone was definitely scared and they were hurt, you know, somewhat. It didn't go, the, it didn't, the stunt did not go the way it should go. And we shut down the movie, we shut down the whole movie. Um, oh my God. First day, this is day one. First day. <sighs> and we replaced a bunch of different people and we had to add like, you know, between 500 and a million, 500,000 and a million dollars to the budget when the budget was 3 million. So it suddenly became 4 million. It's 25%. So, <laughs> Jesus. so it's a 25%, you know, cost. And, um, that was a horrible day, you know, and I, and I felt like I let Scott Derrickson down and, right. and that was my, uh, that was by far the worst day I've ever had on, on set. Now I don't spend a lot of time on set anymore. So I think worse things have happened on our movies. I can hear a director saying, oh my God, there was so much worse that happened on my set. But when, when I was actually on the set, that mm-hmm. was the worst thing that ever happened to me. And it was bad. It was really bad. And last question, three of your favorite films of all time. Citizen Kane, Goodfellas, Moulin Rouge. No horror movies. No, I'm going with those three today. Well, Moulin Rouge is fantastic. And th- yeah. uh, what, are, what are three uh, horror scripts that every horror screenwriter should read? Rosemary's Baby. Oh, great. Such a great movie. Uh, three horror scripts. The Shining. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And... You know, it's not my movie, but a great script to read, which I actually read this just because it's interesting to read as a quiet place. Yeah, it is a great script. That is a great yeah, script. Great script. But I know it still pisses. I, st- I know it still pisses you off, but you've yeah, done okay for yourself. Script. And it was a great movie. You know, it doesn't, and, it doesn't piss me off. I'm just jealous. <laughs> <laughs> and where can people uh, watch uh, the? When is when is it available? The Welcome to the Blumhouse. All the three uh, films, all four films. October 1st and then, and then the 8th. The yeah. So the first two films are on the 1st and the second two films are on the 8th. Perfect. Uh, Jason, thank you October so much. October 1st and October 8th. That <laughs> is. 
than any other month. October is the most important month, of course. Obvi- obviously, obviously. Obviously. It has been an absolute joy talking to you, my friend. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for being on the show, and uh, I, I wish you nothing but more success. And thank you for giving voice to filmmakers that might have not gotten that opportunity through the work that you do, man. So thank you so much. That's nice of you to say. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, my friend. I want to thank Jason so, so much for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much, Jason, for not just coming on the show, but for being an inspiration to independent filmmakers everywhere. And also don't forget to check out Welcome to the Blum House, the four new features that are out on Amazon Prime, Black as Night, Bingo Hell, Madres, and The Manor. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 164. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It truly helps us out a lot. Thank you again for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 